Good morning. <laughs> Turn the mute off. <laughs> we gather to worship, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit is with us all. And as we gather, we welcome those who are joining us by live stream and who will watch the recording later. And uh, thank you to all of you who found your way through the little bit of a maze this morning to join here in the sanctuary for worship. We worship together. We worship God. And as we worship, we acknowledge that we are on the territory of Treaty 7, the Métis Three Nation. Since time immemorial, the lives and spirituality of Indigenous peoples have been connected to this land at the crossing of the Highwood River. It has been a meeting place, a gathering place. We recognize our responsibility to live with respect on this land and in right relationship with the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. May it be so. Amen. This service is brought to you by the words worship and Lord this morning. And so we're going to sing worship the Lord. Celia, did you figure out the... Okay, are you going to show us as we go? Okay, okay. here we go. Please stand. <laughs> I got it. I figured it out though. I <laughs> just got it. We should be loved. We should be loved. We should be Father, the Spirit, the Son. Sign of rejoicing, and with our lips our togetherness may
Would you welcome each other to worship this morning? As we gather this morning, we think of all of the things we do together in service, in worship, uh, beyond just Sunday morning. This evening, we have the wonderful privilege of having Saskia Delarond and Nathan Tinkham, Tinkham in concert here. Um, Marlene will have some tickets around, but you can get them at their door tonight. Bring family and friends. It'll just be a wonderful evening. Seven o'clock, and, and you'll be able to drive right up to the church tonight. <sighs> Um, there'll be coffee and tea on after church today. Um, we have people signing up. Uh, it would be helpful to have someone to sign up for next Sunday and for Thanksgiving Sunday. So if you're going to be around or able to do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, also next Sunday, we will be welcoming the Rural, Min Rural Ministry Conference and uh, have some uh, extra special guests from that conference here. Uh, also, we will be marking Orange Shirt Day. September 30th is actually Orange Shirt Day, um, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. So I invite you to wear something orange next Sunday as we commemorate that day and hold it in our hearts and tell the story. Uh, and last thing to mention is five more leaves went up on our tree out there today. David put them up. You'll notice that they're fall colors now. So we're getting really close to, you know, getting toward that halfway mark. So thank you, everyone, who's been able to join in that one in a hundred initiative. Please join me in the call to worship this morning. It's printed on the first page of your service bulletin. Your words are in bold-faced lettering. We are here today because we have named God the of our lives, the higher power, the guiding force, the wonderful counselor, the main event, the loaf keeper and sustainer of all creation. We are here today because gathering as followers of Jesus is of great worth in our lives. That is what worship is all about. Let us worship God. Amen. I invite you to sing, shout out your love, and while you're singing, to gaze upon the light of the Christ candle. And I'll ask Victoria and Eric, maybe, I think, I think that's how we're doing it. Come on up.
Please join me for the opening prayer. We may not often think of it this way, gracious God, but we, we remember that this is a radical thing we do. We gather to remind ourselves of who and whose we are. We gather as people committed to the way of Jesus. We take time to name you, O oh God, as our higher power, a power greater than ourselves. So many things want us to give them priority. So many things demand to be first in our values and principles. But only you, O oh God, are worth it. Only you can provide the guidance, the hope, the love we need. So call us back to you once again. Guide us away from the powers of the world into your loving care. We ask this as followers of the way of Jesus. Amen. Okay, I have a quick quiz, um, but it's you're going to just do it by yourselves. So you can talk to the person beside you, or you can do it yourself. 
I want you really quickly to name five things that are most important in your life. Ready, set, go. Okay, I'm seeing five fingers go up, okay. Okay, now here's the next one. Which one is the most important? One thing, one thing most important. Got it? Okay. <laughs> Let's sing. This is the day that God has made. We're going to sing it. Uh, Carrie, just a second here. Um, Bruce, can you go to the French? The French verse. Yeah, there we go. Just to review the words. Voici le jour que Dieu a fait, nous le vivrons dans la joie. Voici le jour que Dieu a fait, nous le vivrons dans la joie. Next slide. Chantant Allelu, chantant Allelu, chantant Allelu, nous le vivrons dans la joie. Chantant Allelu, chantant Allelu, Chantant Allelu, nous le vivons dans la joie. Okay, so we'll start in English, then French, then English. Let's stand and sing. people are going with David this morning. I just want to make one small correction. Susan said that we need volunteers for coffee for next weekend. That's the coffee party. No, we don't need volunteers. We have lots. I should have known. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get you all to join me in the prayer of illumination? 
as we worship you, O oh God, in the beauty of holiness. Touch our hearts and minds with your word and with your love. Amen. And the scripture this morning is Psalm 96, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The word is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy for the Lord, for his coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Herein is good news. Thanks be to God. Worship the Lord. This phrase is often used in Christian communities, but what does it mean? Specifically, what does worship mean and what does Lord mean? I have to say it's been wonderful receiving from you uh, phrases and words that you are curious about, wondering about. Uh, we've got quite a list going, and it's just been a real treasure to dive into and think about these. So today, at the request of a congregational member, I'm looking at worship and the Lord, and I've chosen to do the two of them together since the meanings are somewhat intertwined. Now, to do understand these words, we have to do a bit of a word study taking us into Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Old English, Middle English, and maybe a bit of Norse and Germanic. So here we go. Let's start with worship. This word comes to us from Old English, a combination of the words worth and Skype. Worth meaning that someone or something has value or merit, is appreciated, esteemed, highly thought of, or deserving. Skype, spelt S-C-I-P-E, which became the ending ship, means having the quality or condition or a relationship with whatever word it's added to. So, for example, we have friend, and we have friendship, which is the quality, condition, or relationship of being a friend. So worship is about naming something or someone as having the quality of being worthy, valuable, highly thought of, esteemed, and appreciated. To worship God is to say that God is valuable in our lives, highly thought of, esteemed, and appreciated by us. To worship God is to name our relationship with God. God is worthy of our respect, honor, and gratitude. But of course, the meanings of words continue to develop. 
Worship grew to mean showing reverence and honor and adoration to God, but also to royalty, to church leaders, to mayors called their worship, and others in positions of authority and power. The original meaning of the word gave the sense that the person or deity being worshipped had earned the respect, honor, and adoration being given to them. However, it began to be expected that one would worship someone in a particular role. Royalty, church leaders, mayors, heroes. Whether or not their actions actually made them worthy of respect and honor. And that's where the word worship has become uncomfortable for some. Worship of God, worship of royalty, worship of church leaders was demanded, not earned. The word worship became about having power over others and requiring that people bow down, obey, submit, fear, and pledge allegiance to the one who had power, whether or not they deserved it. But to worship God is really about entering into a relationship in which we choose, we choose to name God as worthy, value, and deserving of our respect, honor, and gratitude. God does not demand our worship. In fact, in the book of Micah, God gets frustrated with the kind of worship that involves all sorts of sacrifices and empty words. God declares, what do I require of you? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with me. We worship God not because God demands it or requires it, but as an overflowing of our love in response to a caring, compassionate God. We can't help but praise and worship God. But the exploration of worship doesn't end here. Remember the Bible is a translation from Hebrew and Greek through Latin into English and other languages. And so we need to look at the words originally used to describe what is translated as worship in English. So in Hebrew, we have all sorts of words, such as adoba, barak, halal, chelu, zamar, toda, shahak, in Psalm 96, verse 9 that we read today, the word is hishtashavu. And the verse is about dressing up in holy, beautiful, splendiferous clothing to present oneself to God. In the next verse, the word that is translated tremble is about whirling and dancing and shaking before God in worship. In fact, many of the Hebrew words, which are translated as worship in English, are about movement and sound. Bowing down, yes, but also dancing and singing and shouting and twirling. What they reveal to us is that worship comes out of the heart. It is a response to a God so wonderful, so amazing, so great, so beyond anything we can imagine, that our only response is to let ourselves appear foolish as we give glory to God, to praise God with reckless abandon, to let loose and be fools for God, fools for Christ, not holding anything back. But the Puritans took that kind of worship out of us white North Americans. In Greek, which is the New Testament, we also have many words that end up translated in English just as worship or praise. But they also have this sense of joyous movement, deep gladness, praise and singing. In both Hebrew and Greek, there's a sense of bowing down to God in worship, 
honoring that God is greater than all of us, but a bowing down that comes from a heart full of wonder and love, a heart that wants to show respect to the creator of all that is, and it is not demanded or required. Now, there are two important words that I want to focus on that are translated worship. In Hebrew, aboda, and in Greek, liturgia. And these take us one step further in understanding what worship's all about. Aboda and liturgia both mean service to others. Think about it. We say, what time is the service? Or the worship service will be held tomorrow. The word service has come to mean the gathering of people to worship at a certain time. But it comes out of both of these words, aboda and liturgia, service. Sometimes you might hear David and I refer to worship as liturgy, which comes from the word liturgia. Liturgy means the work of the people, the laity. So when we come to worship, we are here to serve one another, to minister to and care for one another, and then to be prepared to go out to serve God in the world. The prayers of the people may be the most significant part of our worship, the most significant moment, because in these prayers we are doing the work of the people by praying for others. That's why I'll pause and give silence for you to add your own prayers. This is our work as God's people. In our prayers, we are serving the world. That is liturgia. So worship's about three things. Coming before God with all that we are and all that we have in joyous abandon with the beautiful holiness of who we are in God's presence. It's about offering ourselves, our songs, our gifts, our love, not because it is demanded of us or required, but because we are so amazed by God's presence in our lives, we just have to give ourselves all that we have and all that we are to God. And worship is about serving and ministering to each other within our time of worship and also in this time being inspired, encouraged, and empowered through our worship to serve the world in Christ's name. Worship the Lord. So now we come to Lord. Once again, this is a word that needs to be considered through Hebrew, Greek, Latin, English, and more. It's also a word like worship that causes problems because of the way it has been used by people in power to demand obedience and servitude. Yet it has interesting meanings in history. So here we go. I'm going to get back to Lord as the English word, but let's start in Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word is Adonai, meaning master or ruler or my Lord. If you're looking in the English New Test, Old, English Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures, the word Lord, you'll notice, is usually presented in all capital letters, L-O-R-D. In these places in the Hebrew text, if you were reading the Hebrew, you would find the four sacred letters for God's name, Y-H-W-H. Now, Christians have often given a pronunciation to these letters, but for Jewish people, the name is too sacred to pronounce. There's too much chance that one might make a mistake and not honor God in the saying of it. So every time Jewish people see the letters Y-H-W-H as they read scripture, they substitute the speaking of that name with Adonai. My Lord. And so that's why you see in English, L-O-R-D in all caps. 
In Greek, the word is kyrios. Once again, the word means master or ruler, the one in charge. We sing in our worship this ancient chant of the church, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. We hear in scripture the declaration, Jesus is Lord. Now here's the interesting thing. To declare Jesus is Lord was a radical, radical act in the first century. It was a risky countercultural statement. When the first followers of Jesus said, Jesus is Lord, or Jesus is my Lord, they were challenging the Roman Empire's declaration that Caesar was Lord. Caesar Dominus in Latin. And they were endangering their lives by claiming Jesus as Lord. Then the Roman Empire embraced Christianity as its religion in 380 AD. Now the declaration Jesus is Lord was no longer a radical statement. It no longer challenged the status quo. The Roman Empire neatly placed Jesus into the Roman patriarchal hierarchy to support the authority of the emperor and the Roman Senate and the Roman army. They co-opted Jesus and used the name of Jesus to force people to become Christians as they conquered and controlled. And we have lived with the consequences to Christianity ever since. Jesus was still Kyrios Dominus, but now was Lord of the Roman Empire. So before I come back to what we do with the word Lord today, I want to go into the English roots of the word Lord. The word Lord in English comes out of the word for loaf, as in a loaf of bread. In the Gothic, Old Norse, and Germanic languages. In Old English, the word was hlafford, which meant the loaf ward or the keeper of the bread. The hlafford or lord was the one who had the responsibility to feed the household and to offer hospitality to guests who might come. The hlafdij hlafdij, or lady of the household, comes from the words meaning the kneader of the dough, the maker of the bread. Therefore, the lady and lord of the household, who were to be the ones who made the bread and managed the distribution of the bread in the household so that everyone was taken care of. Yet, as one author put it, English aristocrats have not been elbow deep in flour for centuries. <laughs> so once again, Lord and Lady lost their original intent. Originally, these words honored those who had a particular responsibility for caring for the people in their extended family. The Lord and Lady ensured that their household was fed and that their guests were welcomed. They did the work. But those words evolved to mean those who had power over others, who made others do the work on their behalf, who demanded taxes and tributes so that they, the Lord and Lady, could eat well, even if the peasants and servants did not eat well. But let's go back to the idea of Lord being the loaf lord, the keeper of the bread, and the Lady, the one who kneads the dough, who makes the bread. Think now of Jesus. Jesus in the Gospel of John declares, I am the bread of life. Jesus tells a parable that begins, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman kneading bread dough. He instructs his disciples to pray, saying, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus breaks bread and feeds thousands. 
At the Last Supper, Jesus picks up the bread and breaks it and says, this is my body given for you. Jesus is the loaf ward, the keeper of the bread, the maker of the bread, the distributor of the bread. And so to declare Jesus is Lord is to declare that Jesus is the bread of life, the loaf keeper for all of creation. For some, however, the words Lord and worship will always be tainted by the way they've been used in hierarchical ways, in demanding and threatening ways. For some, worship the Lord is not a joyous invitation to delight and dance with abandon in the presence of the bread keeper of all creation. For some, the phrase worship the Lord is an all too keen reminder of the way that the church and people in certain positions of power have abused that power and authority, causing immeasurable harm. So here's the thing. Scripture is full of images, amazing variety of images that we can use to describe and name God and Jesus. Lord's only one of them. In our gatherings together, as David and I put together the liturgy, we seek to use a variety rather than depending upon just one way of naming the divine. So if the name Lord bothers you, doesn't resonate with you, find the name that allows you to live fully and joyous, joyously in relationship with God as you follow the way of Jesus. And I invite you to think about what would be the name that you would use for Jesus that would be as radical as the first century Christians saying, Jesus is Lord in the face of the Roman Empire. It's same, the same for the word worship. We need to remember that there are many ways to worship and that worship is about choosing of our own free will to give our hearts to God and to serve God with gladness as we minister to each other and to the world. Worship might be about bowing down and honoring God for some of us, but worship can also be sitting in silence or meditating. It can be praying for others as we drive the tractor or wash dishes. It can be singing and dancing with abandon to whatever music fills our hearts. It can be taking time to say thank you to God and to others. It can be doing the mundane daily tasks that are ours to do with loving kindness and gentleness. It can be sitting and having tea with someone who is grieving. It can be experiencing a breathless awe at the birth of a baby or at the top of the mountain or in witnessing a sunset. Each of us will worship and serve the Lord, the loaf keeper and bread maker of all creation in our own way, with our own words. When we gather, we care for and minister to one another. And we are inspired, encouraged, and empowered in our worship service to go out in Christ's name into the world. This is how. We worship the Lord. Amen. Let us sing together an old hymn of worshiping God, one that some of us might have sung at the beginning of worship every Sunday. Holy, holy, holy.
Please be seated. And we join now in our work that we do on behalf of the world. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God in whom we live and move and have our being, we come to you with all that is in our hearts, with all of our joys and all of our sorrows, all of our delights and all of our concerns. We come to you in gratitude this day. And we take time in our own hearts to offer our thanks. for all the ways you touch our lives, for all the people who surround and love us, for your presence as our hope and our comfort, we give you thanks, O oh God. We bring to you all the prayers of our hearts, our concerns, our worries, our fears, our hopes. We pray today, O oh God, for all who are in need, for those who are dealing with hunger, homelessness, for those who live in areas of the world, in homes, in countries, in villages, where all they know is violence. Bring peace, bring healing, bring possibility. We pray, O oh God, today for all those who are sick, for those in hospital, for those who are undergoing surgery, those who are healing from surgery. We pray for those who are waiting to hear of diagnosis, results from tests, We pray for those today who are feeling lonely, who are living with despair, with addiction. We pray for those who are grieving. And we name now within our own hearts those that we are particularly concerned about today. Be hope, be blessing, be healing for each one we have named. We think of all the needs in this world, O oh God, 
asking for your presence, your compassion. We pray for those in the LGBTQ plus community who live with discrimination, with fear, with wondering if they are truly your beautiful people. Thank you for calling us to be part of your witness that each person is made in your image. Help us to be words of hope, of love, of compassion to all who are wondering what their life is about, who are feeling put down and outcast. Be with this planet, O oh God. Continue to help us learn to work together to care for the earth, for the animals, for the creatures. Show us your way, O oh God. Show us your way, the way that was taught to us by Jesus, and in whose name we gather all of our prayers, praying the words he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Yes, we have an offering to present, an offering of our hearts, our love, our lives. These are our gifts, O oh God, brought in service to your way and your will, to your compassion in this world. Bless all that we offer. Bless and guide us as we share these gifts in service to one another and in service to this world. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning again. Our minute for mission this morning is listening and learning on the path to reconciliation. You bring a gift that I don't have. I bring a gift that you may not have. When Elf DeMont's Roman Catholic father and Anishinaabe mother asked the priest serving the Shawanaga Reserve to marry them, the priest rejected their request, advising them to marry someone of their own kind. Nearby, a United Church minister had a different response. He told the couple he had just two rules. If you have differences, talk them out and just try to get along. Dad and mom said, I think we can do that. 
They brought together First Nations understanding and non-First Nations understanding. That's how I came to the church, Dumont recounts, in a United in Learning webinar. Dumont spent his life in spiritual, as a spiritual leader, serving the United Church as a minister while staying connected with his traditional indigenous spirituality. His memoir, The Other Side of the River, from Church Pew to Sweat Lodge, shares stories of how Dumont walks between the two worlds of indigenous and settler, traditional spirituality and Christianity. Part of the struggle with me in life was to find out who I was as Anishinaabe and who I was as French, Irish, and English mix, Dumont shares. With a foot on both sides of the river, Dumont's words eloquently draw together spiritual threads. There are seven truths in the Anishinaabe teaching, love, courage, respect, humility, truth, wisdom, and honesty. But you can't have one of those teachings or truths without having the others. So you can't have respect without love. You can't have truth without humility, explains Dumont. I took those underlying teachings and applied them to the four teachings on love. Love God, love your neighbor, love your enemy, love self. You can't have one teaching without the other. You can't love God if you don't truly love yourself. You cannot love your neighbor unless you truly love God. In an interview, Broadview Magazine asked Dumont to weigh in on the future of reconciliation. Part of the struggle has to do with learning to walk together again. It means being as open as we can, he says. You bring a gift that I don't have. I bring a gift that you may not have. And as we share, we learn from the gifts that we have been given. Your gifts through mission and service help support the creation and publication of luminous, timely work like Dumont's book, as well as the webinar discussions and education events that follow. Through listening and learning, we take important steps forward on the journey toward reconciliation. And we have copies. Uh, we have uh, copies of this book. I think they're in the cart or in the library, but that we do have a copy of this book. So if, if someone wants to read it, it's a, a really helpful and wonderful read. So thank you. Um, the other thing, I would just ask your prayers this week for, uh, we had two funerals at the church this week, Lucy Steer on Monday, a funeral for that young woman, and also then yesterday for Elsie Nguyen, longtime member of this community. And so we'd ask that you hold the, the Steer and the Nguyen families in your prayers this week. Let us join our hearts together in singing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You.
we have served each other in this time of worship. We go now to serve the world, empowered, encouraged, emboldened to be people of Christ, sharing God's compassion. For we know that the grace of Christ attends us. The love of God surrounds us and the Holy Spirit keeps us now and forevermore. And everyone says, Amen. Amen.